the third of our four presenters for this morning is Stephen Adwang. Stephen is joining us here at Michigan as a Guastalla UMAP scholar, named so in recognition of the um, Guastalla family who graciously supported us to extend the UMAPS program to Kenya. Um, Stephen comes to us from the Department of Informatics and Information Sciences at Rongo University in Kenya. And here at Michigan, he has worked with Jack Jagadish from the College of Engineering and Midas, the Michigan Institute for Data Science. And Stephen will talk to us today about his research that is focusing on how big data and artificial intelligence can support agricultural planning with regards to climate. Stephen. Make sure your microphone is switched on. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Stephen Ajong, as had been indicated. And I'm here to present on a topic that is on uh, how we can be able to use big data analytics and uh, machine learning to improve agricultural act uh, productivity. And uh, this project uh, was uh, being advised by Professor Jag, uh, as uh, indicated by Andres. So I want to start by just trying to introduce a bit of wh why are we talking about climate change. And uh, climate change is uh, one of those crises of our lifetime, uh, mainly caused by increased global warming as a result of high concentration of carbon in the atmosphere. And uh, apparently this is uh, due to the human activities, uh, uh, things to do with uh, uh, cutting down of trees or deforestation, uh, you, uh, improper use of agricultural input and so on. So uh, the future looks a, a, a bit very bleak uh, because uh, the temperature will keep rising and therefore there is need to try to look at then how best can we able to be uh, to handle this. So due to this uh, uh, issue of climate change, there is a frequent and severe weather uh, phenomena that is uh, currently facing the, uh, the world. And some of this includes uh, uh, increased flooding, uh, increased heat waves. There is a lot of uh, uh, in infestation, such as the recent infestation by des desert locust, especially in the African region. So all these threatens uh, the livelihoods, it threatens the lives, uh, because in the wake of uh, these natural disasters, then there is also people being killed. Uh, in terms of livelihoods, it affects uh, much of the economic activities that are being undertaken, and especially the vulnerable sector, which is agricultural productivity. Uh, therefore, for, for the attainment of sustainable development goals, especially goal number 13, which is on uh, climate change, and at the same time, uh, other sustainable development goals that have been implemented by various nations, there is that need for holistic look of, uh, at climate change. Uh, the worst part of it is that it, may, uh, it affects the world, but much of the concentration of the effect of climate change is in the vulnerable groups. These vulnerable groups normally lack the resources to be able to adapt to climate change. They mainly depend on uh, rain-fed agriculture, which is vulnerable to climate change. So, uh, to be able to then understand what is the correlation or what is the relationship between uh, humanity and climate change, then we need also to understand how agricultural productivity is affected by the global population. Uh, as indicated, you can see that uh, there will be, uh, it's projected that by around 2050, we'll have about 10 billion people inhabiting the world. But much of this explosion in population is mainly in the African continent and in the Asian continent. And you remember what I had indicated earlier that this is where the most vulnerable groups live. So if all this then, sorry, require that for the world to be able to meet the food demand, then agricultural productivity must increase by about 50%. But that is not what is happening right now because there is at, uh, as of now, there is about 110% acute famine that is being projected by FAO. Therefore, uh, for, uh, East Africa is one of those regions that has been categorized by the uh, Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations as those regions that rank highest 
in terms of acute famine. And uh, mainly because of the high dependency on rain-fed agriculture, lack of resources to be able to adapt to it, and therefore there will be always that increase in terms of food insecurity, increase in terms of poverty levels. So uh, for the case of Kenya, this is just an example of how climate change is affecting cropping and crop productivity. You can see that in the first, uh, in the first picture, Okay. Yeah. So in the first picture here, there is a bit of stunted growth and a lot of yellowing. And in the second picture, there is uh, at least the crops have tried to reach maturity. But you can see that the grain yield is constrained. And uh, this is uh, despite the fact that sorghum, which is presented in this picture, is one of those hardy crops that is being fronted by the United Nations as a food security crop because it is resistant normally to effects of uh, things to do with the drought. So in the case of Kenyan context, uh, it's uh, projected that by around 2030, the GDP will start to shrink by about 2.4% due to the effects of climate change. And just a typical example is that in 2018, agricultural production reduced from about 6.1% to about 3.6% in 2019. So this then brings the, that holistic view of how then can we be able to look at climate change, look at agricultural productivity, and then look at what other interventions that human beings can be able to uh, take into effect to be able to uh, mitigate against the effect of climate change. <coughs> Sorry. And that is what brings me to climate smart agriculture. Uh, climate smart agriculture looks at three key pillars. One of them is how can we be able to improve agricultural productivity? And this agricultural productivity that we can be able to improve, can we make it sustainable so that we have enough food for consumption and we also have surplus for sale to increase or to improve uh, uh, the livelihoods of people? But at the same time, we know very well that agriculture is not only affected by climate change, but is also a great contributor to climate, uh, to climate change. Things to do with, like, uh, things to do with the, the application of uh, soil amendments uh, like uh, fertilizer, the use of herbicides, the use of pesticides, all contribute to co climate change. So then, can we be able to be build an adaptive system that can be able to be resilient to uh, the effect of climate change? But at the same time, can we also be able to look at mitigation aspect? Because climate change, you can either adapt to it or mitigate against it. And mitigation will be looking at how then can we be able to reduce the greenhouse gas, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions that agricultural productivity contribute to in the environment. So my project is trying to then look at three aspects of cropping or three aspects of agricultural productivity. That is crop management. Can we be able to manage crops, uh, cropping activity in such a way that we are improving productivity, we are reducing or eliminating greenhouse gas emission, but at the same time, we are building resilience of farmers towards that better agricultural productivity. Issues to do with soil management, so that instead of applying fertilizer in the whole farm, can we be able to use the technologies that we have to select the specific areas of the farm that is nutrient uh, defi uh, deficient and be able to apply those soil amendments. And then lastly, water conservation. Can we be able to introduce certain technologies that can be able to help us Im improve cropping productivity in the face of constrained water or uh, uh, introduce cropping uh, patterns that can be able to help us conserve and reduce the use of uh, water? So, to be, for us to be able to do that, one of the technologies that is currently being prompted or the, that is currently being pushed by uh, most uh, institutions is what we call data-driven agriculture. So that instead of relying on our personal experiences, instead of relying on maybe what, what your neighbor has done in terms of farming, can we be able to use the data that is available to be able to predict or be able to give certain information that can help a farmer 
to make better decisions. And that's uh, what we call agriculture 5.0 or data-driven agriculture that is mainly dependent on the use of uh, data to make a decision rather than the use of uh, personal experiences and so on. And for us to be able to understand that, I will just give a simple example. <coughs> In the Kenyan context, uh, we used to do planting around February or March. But then that is currently changing because the weather patterns or the raining seasons have changed. So that instead of doing it around February, we are now doing it around, we are farming around March. So how do we then project or know that it will rain? Most of us normally wake up in the morning and then we look at the sky, which doesn't work here. Because uh, like the whole day here, if this was in Kenya, then I would say that it would rain, but probably it would not. So we look at the sky, if it is cloudy, chances are high it may rain. So how can we be able to change that? So that instead of just looking at the sky, we have certain information that is based on certain past, uh, 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 past uh, contribution of the productivity levels that we have in the country. So the use of agricultural analytics and the use of artificial intelligence can be able to learn from those past experiences using the data that is available to make certain decisions that a farmer can be able to make to improve its agricultural productivity. And that's why I'm giving a, just a typical example. We have the cropping uh, season. So in this cropping season, you will collect certain information. Feed that information into certain platform, then be able to analyze the information and make certain decisions to be able to actualize what we're referring to as climate smart agriculture. So the net effect is that we can be able to model this situation in such a way that at the end of the day, you have a model that can be able to feed or can be able to learn from real-time data that is collected from the environment, and a farmer can be able to then know that if I plant this crop or this seed variety, I apply these soil con conservation measures, then I can be able to improve agricultural productivity in this manner. And this has been used in quite a number of uh, cases. An example is in Colombia where uh, the same model was used and the agricultural productivity of rice improved from about one uh, metric ton to about three metric ton. It has also been used in corn yield uh, prediction here in, in, in the US. It has been used also in uh, uh, genetic sequencing of uh, gene, uh, uh, s uh, genetic sequencing of certain uh, gene varieties of crops to be able to improve the agricultural productivity in this area. So for the sake of this uh, uh, presentation or for this project, I'll be able to then look at what are some of the data that you would require to make certain predictions. And uh, look at, uh, I'll be able to uh, uh, rely on data on rainfall, uh, rainfall and temperature and also on agronomic uh, data, that is mainly the rain-fed production, and be able to make uh, certain prediction based on rain-fed yields. Even though uh, later on, the next phase of the uh, study will then be able to look at how about the other predictions that I've listed. Because for us to be able to have a system that is robust, then we need to have more simulations, more predictions, so that we have a better prediction that even if you take to the farmer, they'll be able to accept that technology. Because one of the things that normally affect uh, introduction of a technology is that there is that resistance, there is that lack of trust between the, uh, the, uh, the users of that technology and those who are introducing that technology to them. So uh, I'll rely on data that is uh, mainly generated from around the Lake Victoria region. And Lake Victoria region is very, is very key in this. One of the reasons is that uh, the, uh, the Lake Victoria Basin is it experiences one of the most uh, vari variable climatic conditions. And it's even projected that in the next 500 years, the lake may dry out. So there is that need to uh, look at how to improve agricultural productivity in, in that area. So then, uh, when I tried to simulate the situation using uh, various models that are available, you get that linear regression was uh, performing way better than other regression or mo uh, other models that, other machine learning models that are available. Because it was fairly, it had a, a fairly good correlation between rainfall temperature and the yield, and also 
very uh, low uh, errors. So when that was applied to the temperature, you can see that the temperature is projected to be increasing, uh, will increase by about from 3 to 3.5, averagely by around uh, in the next 100 years. And then rainfall will become more erratic from around negative 2 millimeters to about 8 millimeters per year. And then for the yield, it will reduce from around 1.1 metric, uh, metric ton uh, per year to about 0 0.8 metric ton. Then when I try to then look at the, uh, if you, what if you compare rainfall and yield, then you see that also the, uh, uh, the prediction says that there will be uh, some reduction in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in yield, and also because it's affected by rainfall, and also in terms of temperature, it greatly affects production. So because that, uh, that's where you see there is a quite some steep slope of agricultural yield. So what next for, for this? Uh, the next phase is then try to look at those other predictions that I'd already mentioned. How then can we be able to implement them, have better simulations that can be trusted? And that will be done through a collection of data from the ground and then building of several simulations that can be able to inform certain decisions. Because the main aim of this is can we be able to inform policies that can be implemented to improve agricultural productivity especially on aspect of water management, uh, cropping management, and also on soil management. And this is the model that I would want to use to then finalize the, the remaining phase of the study, which is then, can we be able to collect the information that I've already indicated, then analyze that information and check whether these pre, uh, models that we'll be able to create are going to be very accurate, precise, and can give us, with, with low uh, variance and low bias, to be able to give us those climate smart agricultural aspect of better production, uh, 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 better adaptation and resilience, and also reduction in, uh, and also reduction in greenhouse gas emission. Thereafter, we have a model that can be able to interact with the environment and be able to uh, uh, constantly get information from the environment and then be able to inform decisions that a farmer can be able to take. And we'll, that will also be done with the realization that data is a very big challenge, especially in the African continent. And one of, this, uh, one of the presentations I attended, it was indicated that chances of one being uh, involved in a study in Africa is about one to about 100,000 people. In the US, it's about one to about 1,000 people. So that tells us data will be a problem, but hopefully we'll be able to handle that. Uh, as I conclude, I want to thank the University of Michigan, the African Study Center, through uh, the headship of uh, Andres and uh, Henrique. I also want to thank my advisor, Prof. Jag. I want to thank the MIDAS, where I've been uh, attached to up to this time and also the School of Information Science, led by the Dean and uh, Professor Kentaro. They have been very helpful in terms of helping me shape up this. Thank you so much. The member of this poll, Kohert. Uh, thank you very much for your nice presentation. Uh, you give less about how can we mitigate uh, the current global environmental challenge that the, the global humanity is facing, especially in the agricultural sector. But my fear is that uh, these uh, low-income countries of Africa have uh, limitations of state capacity in a way that uh, the, to, to ensure productivity uh, by mitigating uh, emerging challenges of global environmental challenge uh, demands uh, the capacity of the state in terms of technology, in terms of efficiency, professionalism, and research institutions. Uh, so uh, in the current context of African countries with a series of financial, bureaucratic, and different forms of limitations, uh, do you think that this is a project which is feasible? 
beyond uh, those research institutions. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that question, sir. A question, Mohammed. Uh, this project comes at the backdrop that uh, it's, uh, th there is a lot of studies that have been done on this, and one of those studies indicate that previously there was very little in terms of technological uh, availability in the African continent. But more and more uh, technological availability is becoming, av uh, is coming, becoming uh, uh, frequently available in the African continent. And I think about the ownership of mobile phone has almost tripled over the years. So the issue of technological uh, availability in Africa is currently being solved in most states. And one of the uh, research institutions are even indicating that technological availability is almost reaching 70, 80% in Africa. The main challenge uh, that would be experienced or that is noted in these studies is that the network connectivity or the internet is still a main challenge. So that means that when you are uh, delivering a technology, you deliver m less of it through the use of internet and more of it through the use of feature phones, like a mobile phone, a mo like a, a basic phone that can just deliver, send a message. Because more people own mobile phones that can just, uh, uh, you can send a message or receive a message. But when you bring in the aspect of uh, internet, that will have almost, uh, will have a challenge. But uh, feature phones are, are available. Thank you, and as you know, we have a Zoom audience and we have some questions from there, so I'll hand over to Enrico, who is our Zoom person. person. <laughs> Enrico. Um, the first one, uh, Stephen, is more a comment than a question. Um, it's from Panos Papalambros, um, who is um, going to be working with an incoming UMAP scholar. Um, he says that this was a wonderful presentation, but I want to read it to you all because you see how things connect here. Um, so Panos and his UMAP scholar are uh, looking at a similar problem as a system design optimization, optimization formulation, um, which they are um, applying in the context uh, of Uganda, and um, they want to be in touch with you because your work can feed into the design work, including crop design and maximum social benefits. So Thank you so much. I'll be happy to work with them. And that, that is one of the things that just make us so happy to see how connections between different UMAP scholars from different parts of Africa are happening. So that's, that's great. Thank you, Panos. For and then he has part. a follow-up question about this. And then I get to one more question. So Panos asks, what is the mechanism you envision so you can really connect with the farmers, particularly in small lots? Uh, the approach that uh, in most cases are being fronted that, uh, that I think has uh, proven to work well is whereby you introduce or you uh, get into farmers through the use of uh, what we call the lead farmers and through the use of what we call farmer research networks so that you're able to bring them on board. Because the one challenge that we uh, those, uh, those who develop technology normally experience is that you concentrate too much on the development of the technology without the input of the users. So uh, the best approach to be able to bring everybody on board is through a participatory approach where the users are involved all the way from the process of the uh, model development all the way to the point of introduction so that they, there is that greater uptake or adoption of that technology. Thank you. And then the second question from Zoom is from Akbar Walje, who does a lot of data science work in Kenya as well. And he asks, uh, Dr. Aitwan, have you thought of using other ML methods such as random forest? And can you speak also to the use of other calibration of models? Yes. Uh, random forest is one of the ensemble learning models that uh, uh, is possible to be used. So for the sake of this simulation, I was able to only use four, but there are also others that could be used. And that's why I was saying that because of the limitation of the data, I was not able to use other models that are available. But as we collect more data, then I can be able to compare as many models as possible so that I'm able to get, because the key goal is, can we have a stable and accurate prediction 
that can give information because you don't want to give information to a farmer who is already vulnerable and then when they introduce that technology to the field, it fails. So you need to simulate as many as possible. And I think what a random forest is one of them that uh, uh, I'll be able to work on. Uh, the last question, kindly, uh, uh, there is, uh, I think he asked the second part of the question. Uh, yes, can you speak a little bit about other ways of... What are your additional thoughts about calibration of models? Uh, calibration of models, ca you can, uh, in cases where you have like underfitting and overfitting of those models, then you can be able to smooth them out through certain parameters that are available. So before you uh, introduce that, you look at that data and start to, uh, to model it, then can you be able to look at those issues like the underfitting of the models, the, the overfitting of the models, so that you smooth them out such that whenever they're giving that prediction, then uh, it's a reliable prediction. Thank you. So, so one thing that I want to note here is, you know, Stephen has been working with um, uh, a faculty member here who's in the College of Engineering. Now we got another question from the College of Engineering from the medical school is where Akbar Waldry is. So just showing how all these things are connected. So um, we have time for another few questions and we have one from the audience. Can you catch? Remember to introduce yourself. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Brett Eastman. Uh, I work in the law school. Um, this was a wonderful presentation, and you mentioned a couple times um, the potential of this research to inform government policy, public policy. Um, and I can't help but think of the potential this has in informal settlements like Kibera, uh, because we know that communities that are unstable and have uh, low socioeconomic background often struggle with food insecurity first and foremost, but also bear the brunt of climate change. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was wondering if you or any of your colleagues um, consider those type of social impacts, and if so, if you could speak a little bit more uh, to that, please. Okay, uh, uh, for, 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 the, for the case of this study, I was looking much more into the farming community, because in Kibera, they don't do farming because it's an informal settlement. But of course, uh, the issues of data science and uh, modeling can be applied in all social sectors or the social aspect of, uh, uh, of the society. So it's an area that probably we can also look at in terms of then, we, yes, we've already produced enough, then can we be able to start to in, uh, send to that, that uh, the agricultural community has produced to help improve the living conditions of those who live in the informal sectors? So it's an area that uh, it's possible to interrelate from uh, the agricultural aspect to those other social issues that are experienced by the informal sectors of the society. Thank you. Thank you. So we have time for one more question, and we have a Zoom question, but do we have another question from our in-person audience? <laughs> okay, let's do a Zoom question from Kenya, and then if we're short, we might still be able to go to Nkem. Because this is a short question, but... But uh, from Kenya, so from very Kenya. relevant. <laughs> yeah, because... Yeah. Yeah. It's similar to your question, Britt. So the question is from Ngunjiri Ndirangu, okay. and he says, congratulations, Dr. Idrang, coming from Kenya. Who are you able to communicate your findings to in terms of policymakers okay. in Kenya um, so that we can work on implementation? Okay. So the, uh, the, the, the policy introduction into the field is, uh, because normally farmers do trust much more of the government institutions. So my intention is to, to work with the, at the county, at the county levels. I think he understands what the county level means and the sub-county levels, especially the agricultural directors at those county, uh, county and sub-county levels so that they are able to then uh, inform the farmers because farmers would trust them much more uh, than when just any random researcher bringing in any technology to them because they are people that they interact with, the people that they understand. So the best way that I will be able to uh, bring in <coughs> on board all this uh, 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 model plus the, uh, the farming community is to use the government institution, especially at the sub-county and the county level. Yeah. So our last question, and hopefully it's a short one to Kem. Yes, short one. Kem Kumba again for, with mathematics here in Michigan. Okay. So I saw, um, if I get your, your search for data a little um, uh, correctly, yeah. have you thought about uh, integrating some of your models into, say, regional uh, meteorological data systems? 
that have a longer view and a more broader geographic view, uh, and also oceanography data systems. Kenya is off the uh, Indian coast, and as, that might enrich a little bit more of your data profiles. Yeah, I think that's, that's an area that I've thought about because, again, as I indicated, data is a challenge in, in, in the Kenyan context. So what I'll be able to do is then, can we be able to use the already available models that have been tried, uh, and, uh, especially on the climate, because on the climate aspect of, uh, of this project, much of the data or much of the models are already being simulated. Can we then be able to infuse those models together with uh, the agricultural aspect of this model then be able to have a long-term solution to those challenges? So I'm thinking of using remote sensing data in cases where I'll not be able to get data on the ground. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, everyone.